Once more, I welcome everybody uh, to the first lecture uh, of Dynaflow 2014. I see a lot of familiar faces, so it's always good, and uh, some new faces. Um, we are happy to uh, present two uh, 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 presenters today, uh, one of uh, which is Frank Boss, he's a colleague of mine. He will uh, discuss the topic of analysis of wealth subjected to fatigue. And we have uh, a very interesting uh, guest uh, speaker today uh, from uh, Aplus uh, RTD. Uh, he's sitting over there, there Niels uh, Brotsken. Persken. Persken. I'm sorry. You can call me Niels, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you will be uh, talking about uh, ultrasonic 3D imaging uh, uh, technique, which was recently, I think, recently developed uh, by RTD. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thanks that you come here in such uh, large numbers. Um, my name is Niels Pertzgen. I work for A plus RTD. Uh, A plus RTD is a company that provides services in non destructive testing. And, um, well, let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is the content of my presentation. This is what I prepared for you. Um, what you've seen in the previous presentation is that uh, when it comes to fatigue and defects, uh, in order to do calculations, it's very important to, in the first place, find the defect and also try to assess them. Um, and that's also in this presentation. So what I've prepared for you is, is first uh, a, a short introduction. Uh, it has a bit of an overlap with the pre previous presentation, but it, it, sets, it sets the scene, right? So I first talk about the issue, um, what it is that concerns us so much. Um, then I talk more about the question, what it is that we're looking for. Because we have an issue, uh, that issue is caused by something, could be fatigue, could be something else. Um, but in order to find it, we first need to know what we're looking for. Uh, and that gives us the objectives for non-destructive testing. So before the accident happens, we would like to examine, we would like to do an inspection uh, without damaging the component, of course. So by means of non-destructive uh, testing, in order to see if there's any defects in, in our components or in our wells. Um, then what I will present is two, let's say, well-known methods to inspect uh, by means of non-destructive testing. And well, radiography, that's, that's probably the most well-known, uh, and the ultrasonic one as well. Uh, I wasn't sure whether these people here in the room uh, have some, some background knowledge about this, but still I would like to uh, present them in short so that you have basic understanding as to uh, what it can do, but also what it cannot do. Uh, and that is something that I would like to explain because these existing technologies, they have limitations. And these limitations, that is also what triggered the, uh, the research of, uh, of the new uh, imaging methodology that I would like to present. And that's basically the IWIS technology. So this part of the presentation covers, well, a bit of the, uh, the principles. Uh, where does it come from? How, how does it work? Uh, in theory, theory is important. Uh, but also I will give some examples of machines, reflectors. So first, if you develop something, uh, you would like to see if it works. And therefore, you use something that you know exists, and that's machine defects. Uh, <coughs> but the world doesn't exist, of, or real defects aren't very much like the machine ones, so you would like to do it on, uh, on actual samples. So what I would like to share with you is some examples uh, of real defects in real wells. Now also, what I have is uh, a small video clip, it's uh, two minutes, uh, because we did, extra, uh, we did a field trial on the field, so that you have an idea as to how this inspection would work under, under field conditions. And of course, I will end my presentation with some concluding words. Uh, but first, what's the issue? Uh, well, we saw some images of uh, an exploding tank, of planes, uh, these are more related to, uh, to pipeline issues, and as you can see, uh, it's, it's straightforward actually. Um, the environmental damage, the safety hazards, economical spills, um, and really these examples aren't really hard to find. If you, if you Google on, uh, 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 on the internet, well, these, these images uh, pop up, so um, they do occur, and as a matter of fact, uh, in the United States, the Department of Transportation, they, they keep close records of, of these failures and, and uh, obviously they also examine them. 
uh, but also in Canada, uh, you can find records. The National Energy uh, Board of, uh, of Canada, they, uh, they have these, uh, these research whereby they analyze what, what actually was the cause of the failure. And, and that's, of course, the first step. If, if, if an accident happens, you would like to know why, why it happened. Uh, and it depends on, on the degradation mechanism. So there's different degradation mechanisms, uh, fatigue being one of them, but there's also other ones. For example, uh, incorrect, uh, incorrect construction of the process, defects in wells is, uh, is such an example, an incorrect de design. Uh, well, if the component, or in this case, if the pipeline wasn't designed to fit its purpose, uh, that could be the cause of failure. Uh, also, corrosion leads to a wall thickness loss, or wall thickness loss. Um, has an effect on, on the strength of the pipeline, and also that can cause failure. Uh, but also, one that you find uh, rather uh, commonly is mechanical damage. <clears throat> For example, landslides or uh, a digging machine, a backhoe that uh, digs into the earth and, and, and hit uh, a pipeline, uh, that can cause uh, a mechanical damage that eventually could lead to a failure. Well, if you can see the statistics, metal loss, uh, is one of the uh, the largest ones, uh, but also cracking, and that is to narrow down the scope of my presentation a bit, the one that I will talk about uh, in more detail. Uh, the cracks or crack-like defects that is uh, 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 well, a very large part that causes failure. So now that we have seen some of the failure mechanisms, um, some of the degradation mechanism. Uh, we can have a closer look and see, well, what, what was actually the, the, the reason? So what is it that we're looking for? Because if we, again, want to inspect these pipes, we need to know exactly what we're looking for. Um, during the construction phase, this type of defects can come into, uh, into your weld, such as lack of fusion, we've seen it in the previous presentation, <coughs> but also incomplete penetration, undercut, high-low. These are, these are a group of defects that you can find uh, in, in welds that are caused by the production process. So before the pipeline is even in, uh, in production uh, phase, then they could be already in, in your pipe. Well, during the operational phase, there's other cracks, crack-like defects that can occur, for example, fatigue cracks or SEC, that's uh, stress corrosion cracks, that are commonly occur in these, in these clusters. Uh, hook cracks, uh, such as, uh, as you can see here. Um, and, well, there's some nice examples of ruptures that, that are initiated by these, uh, these, small, these small cracks. So therefore, it's, it's paramount that you are able to find these cracks before they rupture. And that is, that is really the challenge. So we have seen some of the degradation mechanisms. We have seen uh, what we're looking for. And then the next question is, well, how can we find it? Um, and that is, for each non-destructive testing methodology, the first question you have is what is that we would like to find? Um, the first step is to detect it. If we can detect it, we don't know it's there. We don't know anything. So designing a non-destructive testing methodology first focuses on the question, can we detect it in the first place? Uh, of course, that depends on the characteristics of the indication. Um, we, we want to know if it's even capable of detection because maybe we detect something and it's not there. We have a false call. Um, so, uh, these questions are very important during the design of the non-destructive testing um, methodology. Then the second question is, well, if we have detected something, uh, we're not there. I can tell a pipeline owner, well, I found a crack. Yeah, but then the second question, of course, is, well, how severe is it? What's, what's the extent of the crack? Is, is it harmful? Uh, and that's also a nice bridge with the previous presentation, because if we do not understand or if we cannot tell the extent of the, of the indication or, or the depth of the crack, well, then we need to build in some conservatism. Then we have to assume that it is harmful. And thereby, we may uh, repair the pipeline uh, for, for, well, for, for unright reasons. Um, so we need to know the, the location and the size of the defect, also the nature of the indication, if it was an indication. Uh, and as rule of thumb, if you find something, um, then you should also have some form of acceptance criteria. And then what you do is you check that acceptance criteria with the indication you find. And if it's acceptable, then we 
typically talk about in the case. If it's not acceptable, then we talk about a defect. Um, so, in a sense, it's very important to use the right tool for the job. Um, for example, if I, if I want to have a very accurate measurement, well, then I'd rather not measure with this type of equipment. I, I have to use another equipment. Um, and that is very important for, uh, for the non-destructive testing technology. It should be the right type of equipment for the job. It should have the accuracy, it should have the detectant, uh, detection capabilities um, uh, that suits the needs for, for the job. Um, so those are the basics. Again, to give a short summary, we know what we're looking for. Uh, we know the essence of the design of our uh, non-destructive testing methodologies. And what I will do is I will give you two examples that are, that are commonly used which is non-destructive testing based on radiography uh, and non-destructive testing based on <coughs> ultrasonic inspection. <coughs> so it's two different physical principles with, of course, both their, uh, their advantages, but also both of their limitations. So the first one is uh, radiography. Um, actually, this is one method that, that exists for quite some time. Um, and, well, it depends on, uh, it's, it's, it's based on, uh, on x-ray. X-ray is able to propagate through material, um, and that material, depending on the material, has different uh, absor absorption properties. Uh, and that's how you can find defect, because a defect is a different medium, uh, and thereby it has different absorption properties. So what you do is, you'll have a film, that film uh, is sensitive to X-rays, much like a, 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 well, a photo uh, film that we have uh, in, uh, in all the times. And, um, by exposing this film to the x-rays, you either get uh, um, uh, well, a, a black indication or a white indication, depending on the absorption. So the level of absorption, again, depends on the material. <laughs> um, and, well, the, the indications on the film, that, that's basically uh, how you can see uh, the defects uh, by grayscale. But this is an example of uh, an in, in internal inspection. So in this case, you need the axis uh, inside the pipe. This is the, the, the x-ray source and then the film is placed around the pipe, in this case on the curved well. Uh, in this case we have another smaller component whereby the source is placed above and the, the x-rays are uh, propagating uh, all the way through. So what does it look like? These are, these are typical the, um, uh, the results that you get from, uh, from radiography. Uh, you can see there, there's a crack right there. Um, you can see all sorts of indications right there. It could be porosity. Uh, there's crack-like indications there. Um, and typically what they do is they have these contrast indicators to make sure that you detect it. So that's, that's a confirmation that your inspection methodology works. Again, the first thing of NDT is can I find it? Well, therefore I need to do a check by these contrast indicators. And the second is, can I, can I say something about it? Well, as you can see in this type of cases, you can see that there's a crack. But I'm not able to tell how deep the crack is, because it's a projection, right? And the th same accounts for this crack, if you can see it. Of course, I'm pointing on it now, so you're able to see it. Uh, but it requires uh, a skilled person to interpret these type of, of films. Um, maybe if you didn't have a good day, and you look at the film, you, you might easily uh, lose an indication, although you'll have these contrast indica indicators. Um, so when it comes to radiography, it's, it's, it's a commonly used technology for detection, specifically for these porosity, for these inclusions, for copper inclusions or slag or bubbles that have a volume. Uh, the absorption methodology works quite fine. But for cracks, well, in this case, you can see that it works. Uh, and the reason why it works is because the x-ray source was right on top of it, right? But if this crack was not very much, uh, or, or if the orientation of the crack wasn't in favor of the direction of the x-ray beam, uh, well, then the absorption is very low and you might miss it. Uh, so the probability of detection for cracks, well, it's questionable. You can detect them, uh, but you need to be lucky in, in terms of the orientation. Now, also one limitation of radiography, of course, is that you need radiation. Uh, radiation is still hazardous for people, um, and therefore radiation is often done in, in, in the industry 
uh, during the night hours, um, which is, well, a practical limitation. It's, it's not a fundamental limitation, it's practical. Uh, and also, um, it takes some time to, to make these images because you need to develop them. So you shoot a film, and then, well, the film needs to, needs to, to be developed. And that, that's time to do. So it has some, um, some benefits. You have a, a method to detect them, but it also has some limitations, and that is, well, again, sometimes you might, might be able to miss it. <coughs> Sizing is not really, uh, not really possible, and, uh, well, it takes some time. So let's move on to the next uh, methodology, which is based on ultrasonic testing. Um, this is based on sound, and it's ultrasound, so it's a high frequency. You cannot hear it. Uh, but it's a vibration, and the, basically the, uh, the philosophy uh, of inspection by ultrasonic waves is ultrasonic waves also propagate through material, and, uh, well, they bounce back, uh, much like a sonar. So, if there's a defect, uh, and you have an ultrasonic wave, then, well, that wave can reflect to that, uh, uh, to that defect, and what you receive back is pulse. And therefore, I have this uh, illustrative animation. So this is a sensor, it generates a wave, it's a short pulse, here you can see the pulse traveling, and um, that pulse travels in a certain small beam, right, it's, it's almost like a laser pointer, yeah, so um, with this element you can generate a lot of short pulse, and well you can see if this has the right orientation then you can receive it back because it travels back to the, to the sensor, uh, and what you would see on your screen uh, is this peak. So it has a certain travel distance and a certain amplitude height. And that's basically the only two pieces of information that you'll have from ultrasonic inspection. You'll have a transit distance or, or travel time, and you'll have a peak height. Now, you can imagine that if you have a, a, a large defect, then the reflective surface of that defect is larger, and you'll receive more sound back. And therefore, this amplitude will be higher. So the detection of defects with ultrasound is based on, well, do I get a peak or not? And then uh, the sizing is mostly done based on this amplitude height. Yeah. So what you do is, in practice, um, you, you need some kind of calibration procedure to know how, how high is high. And typically that's done on machine reflectors, for example, uh, through drilled hole that has a certain diameter, maybe two millimeters. Um, and that is what you use to calibrate your system, and then you do the examination and you relate the amplitude from your calibration reflector, which is a known reflector, uh, well, to the, to the reflection that you receive from your defect. Um, so what you see here is a manual uh, ultrasonic testing uh, experiment. Uh, there's a defect or a weld here, and you'll have one ultrasonic sensor <coughs> with one ultrasonic beam, and you just, well, try to find the defect. Uh, well, the benefit of this is that, well, it's not hazardous, uh, but it's quite sensitive to, well, the orientation and the position of this defect. Because if you can uh, look at this picture, if this defect is, for example, somewhere else, then I might miss it. Uh, if the defect has a different orientation, it's much like a mirror, the energy reflects away and I would not receive it. So if I find a defect, then I'm happy. Uh, and, and if I find something, then, then well, the sizing has its limitations because the only thing I have is this, is this echo amplitude. Um, a more accurate way of doing this inspection um, is by means of an automated <coughs> ultrasonic setup. Uh, and that's basically more of the same. So in the previous sheet you saw the inspector with only one ultrasonic sensor, which has one ultrasonic beam. Uh, well, what I could do is I could extend that into a more, uh, well, a large scale and have just more sensors, yeah? So, ultrasonic testing uh, in an automated sense uh, is typically done in this type of situation whereby you have a zonal discrimination concept. <coughs> so this is the cross-section of the weld and you divide the weld into several depth zones and each depth zone is then inspected by its own dedicated um, probe configuration. So in this case, you have seven different configurations. That means that you also need seven different uh, probes. For each zone, you need one probe. Uh, the calibration procedure is 
uh, is important. And typically we use these type of blocks. And here you can see that there's machined reflectors. And the intention is to calibrate each individual sensor on these, on these, on these uh, reflectors. Um, so that is, that is done. Uh, basically, this is, this is the benchmark for ultrasonic inspection of birth welds uh, today. Um, one important thing is that we need to, we, we make an assumption on the location of the defects. Uh, and this inspection concept is basically designed to find lack of fusion type of defects. Um, so other defects that are in there are also, uh, you, can, you can also find them, but the design is basically on uh, the, the lack of fusion type of defect. Yeah, so this is basically the benchmark of uh, the, the inspection uh, methodology uh, of, of automated ultrasonic testing. Now, as you can see, for each individual channel or for each individual configuration, you need a probe. And these probes, because these only generate one beam, uh, for a new bevel design, again, you need new probes. So from a practical point of view, oh, that, that's, that's a limitation. You need a lot of these probes. Um, also, if you look at uh, the results of, uh, of a typical inspection, this is typically the type of uh, result that you get from an inspection. Uh, and you can imagine that you have to be familiar with this type of uh, display in order to do the interpretation. So I can say that there's a defect here, uh, but, and, and I can say something about the size, but it's quite, quite a challenge. It's, it's not straightforward. Uh, it requires an, 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 a trained operator in order to, to say something about it. Um, but then again, it's, it's the benchmark. <coughs> now, uh, other than having a fixed probe, we also have uh, new developments, and um, that is based on phase rate technology. So phase rate technology is basically also an ultrasonic inspection uh, concept, but then the ultrasonic beams are controlled by a computer. So you can imagine that that's way more flexible rather than having this entire probe pen with all the individual probes, now I have only one probe that I, that I can uh, control with my computer. Uh, and having that capability, I can also make, for example, a sweep. So in this case, I have a sectorial scan whereby I um, sweep my ultrasonic beam uh, in multiple directions. And the area that I can cover in this case is, is way larger. Uh, not only I can change the angle, but also the position of the, uh, of the entrance point, uh, so I can cover a larger area. So as you can see, this is typically the type of images that you get. They're nice, they're colorful, and uh, they reveal more than the previous strip chart. But still, it's based on, on, let's say, a directional beam like this laser pointer. So even if I have a defect that has an orientation that does not favor the direction of my beam, then I could, could miss it. So in terms of probability detection, yes, I have <coughs> more information. So it's better than, than the previous concept. Uh, but still, it's possible to miss defects. So to give a summary, uh, I presented radiography. The detection of cracks is sensitive to the orientation. Uh, so the probability of detection is limited. Uh, it's a projection method, so height sizing is quite challenging. Uh, because of the radiation, it's hazardous, so it's a practical problem. And it is slow due to the film, uh, due to the fact that you need to develop the film. Right? Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, uh, you say a film development, but nowadays you have detectors that's uh, uh, digital, so yeah. the film development is no issue anymore. Uh, that's true. Uh, some uh, systems are based on digital radiography, and uh, indeed the development uh, is taken out of the way. Uh, but then one of the limitations of radiography, of digital radiography, is for some cases the resolution of the of the digital plate is not sufficient enough for uh, for for the radiography. So, um, for example, for for medical purposes, that resolution is sufficient. Uh, but well, for small cracks. The resolution of the of the of the plates is not always sufficient, uh, but I have to say it's not in this presentation. But indeed, it is is, is one of the, the upcoming technologies to do it by means of uh, of, of digital radiography. 
Uh, now, as for ultrasonic testing, the detection and sizing depends on the shape of the defect and the orientation, because it's a reflection method. Um, and that means that you have a limited accuracy, because, well, if I have my beam not spot on the defect, it means that I have a, a lower amplitude and I make an undersizing. So detection and sizing are influenced by the horizontal and vertical displacement of the probe. Uh, that means small practical tolerances, and again, well, that, that all depends on how good am I able to hit the defect. Uh, and the interpretation of strip charts, uh, well, it requires experience and skill. Um, so it's, it's ambiguous and less reproducible um, in practice. And that means if I have a strip chart and I give it to one operator, then of course I would like to have uh, one result, and if I give it to the second operator, I expect exactly the same result. Uh, but yeah, because the interpretation can be quite complicated, you'll have, you'll have different opinions. Um, so these different opinions aren't, well, aren't really, uh, really uh, wanted in, in, in practical uh, circumstances. And that brings me to uh, ultrasonic imaging of defects, having presented some of the limitations of, of current technologies. Um, this is basically our objective. So, actually what we what would like to have is a detection uh, methodology that is not dependent on the defect shape or orientation. Uh, we would like to generate an image from a defect in a girth belt or, or, or in another type of uh, uh, structure. Um, and the orientation, the position, the size of the defect should, should be captured in that image. And it's much like these, uh, these examples, for, for example, in the medical field, we have these uh, MRI scans that are really accurate and really nice. So if you look at that application, uh, if you look at that application field, you start to wonder, well, why don't we have such uh, advanced and, and accurate methodologies for non-destructive testing? Uh, the same also in the medical field. Uh, this is then based on uh, magnetic resonance. Uh, these images are produced by means of ultrasonics. So we are using ultrasonics in the industrial field, also in the medical field, but still I think that this picture is way more comprehensive than the results that we're producing in the in industrial field. No, but they are not always like this, right? And they're not always like that. <laughs> uh, now also another, uh, another application field is uh, seismic imaging, uh, where we try to find oil and gas fields in the surface, and it's also based on sound, Ultrasonics is sound with a high frequency. Acoustics is sound that you can actually hear. Uh, and here also you can see a very nice and accurate mapping of the seabed, but also the layers uh, are revealed uh, underneath that. So having seen other application fields, uh, well then the question is, why not in our application field? Uh, and well, one of the reasons is that well, human tissue uh, is not the same as metals. So it, the, the physical behavior of human tissue uh, is such different that you cannot copy that technology one-to-one -one, uh, in our application field. Um, well, magnetic resonance is something that we do not use. Uh, then we have seismic imaging, and that is actually uh, the one that I will talk a bit more about, because that is what we used to, to do, um, um, that, that, that actually has, has a large amount of similarity with, uh, with our industry. And the reason for that is because of array technology. So I think uh, array technology was introduced um, maybe maybe 10 years ago in the, it, it, we, in the medical field, array technology already exists, uh, but it was not <coughs> advanced enough. But uh, maybe 15 years ago or so, that array technology started uh, to become apparent in, uh, in industrial applications. So having ultrasonic arrays, that ultrasonic array technology suddenly makes seismic imaging into a downscaled experiment. Um, and what you see here is that also, this is how uh, seismic imaging works. You'll have a source, it could be a, a dynamite. It's not very friendly for the marine, uh, for the marine situation. So uh, they use air guns that, uh, that generate a shock wave. And what you can see is that the, the waves generated by these air guns propagate through the, through the water, or here it's a, it's a, it's a surface uh, application. They travel through the surface and they reflect at all these layers, 
And then what, what is done is they have an array of hydrophones or microphones, and they record the upward traveling waves uh, using these arrays. So basically what you get is, is, is a fingerprint. Um, so that's what we also use, the same principle for iWaves. So what we do is we measure wave fields with, with elements, with, with the arrays that we have. Uh, and we do not make use of the directional beams anymore. And that is one big difference in, in the inspection philosophy is that it steps away from these directional beams. Um, so as you can see, the, the standard ultrasonic inspection philosophy, philosophy is based on, on this, well, this laser type of inspection. Uh, by means of phase array, we have just a multitude of these, of these beams and we can cover a larger area, but it's still based on this directional beam. Um, but what we do with IWAX is we use a headlight. So we use one element to, well, basically fill up our volume with sound, and all the other elements are then used to receive the upper traveling wave field. Uh, and that is, that is the fundamental difference. So these elements can be used as both sources and receivers. Uh, so you can measure all the possible combinations of source and receiver elements in one experiment. And of course, you end up with a large data set. So this is one example of a, of a data set. What I have here is an indication, a defect, and here is an array. And the blue uh, squares <coughs> indicate the elements of an array. So what I can do. Yep. Yeah, there we go. So I fire. I fire uh, off one element, and you can see that there's uh, a wave front starting to form. It bounces up and down. And what I can do here, uh, it's much like a, a seismograph. Each trace is the reporting of one element. So this element, for example, records this trace. And at this moment in time, it starts to receive <coughs> a response. And there, it starts to receive another response. Right. So by having one element as a source and all the others as a receiver, I can measure these type of patterns. And these patterns, in this case, it's only from one element, but I can repeat that same experiment by having uh, all the elements as sources. And thereby I get a fingerprint. So, for example, this defect, there's a trace in, our, in my fingerprint right there, but also right there because you, you'll have reflections from the bottom. And this fingerprint, that is basically what I use as an input. So there's my experiment. I have one element, and then the second, and then all the combinations, and I get my data set, and well, now I need to do something with the data set. And this is what I do with the data set. And basically, the data set is a bunch of wave fields that I've recorded. Now, the concept of IWAX is that that wave field that you've recorded can be extrapolated further in time. That means if I have a wave field, I can calculate where that wave field is going to, further in space and later in time, but what I'm doing is the opposite. I can, having measured this wave field, can calculate where it came from earlier in time and backwards into space. So that explains the acronym of IWAX because it's inverse wave field extrapolation. Uh, and basically how it works is that the data set I've measured, that fingerprint, what I do is I define an image space and for each pixel in that image, tray, in that image space, uh, I just propagate my measured wave field back, and well, of course, if there is a defect right there, that means that I somewhere in my data set, um, somewhere in my data set, I have information that corresponds with this pixel. But if there was no um, reflector or nothing, then I don't have any information, so nothing corresponds. Um, so basically, the concept is that for each pixel in my image space, I calculate if there is a contribution somewhere in my data set. To that pixel. Is there, is there, I mean, there are obviously also reflect, uh, reflections from the boundaries, right? Is that, right. Is that pre-calculated? Uh, no. It's it's also in your image. And and that is the beauty of this uh, image, uh, of this beauty of this technology, because um, you don't have to assume where a defect is, you just get it on the plate. But it also means the geometry. So the geometry is also uh, revealed in the image. Um, well, I think it's better explained by just showing some examples. Um, 
this was the concept. And I can imagine that it's you know hard to digest because well, I just explained in a nutshell. Uh, but I hope that I ha have been able to give you an understanding of the concept, right? So I use ultrasonic arrays. I measure a huge data set, and that the data set is then pre-processed into an image. Uh, and also, you can imagine that it's it's quite challenging uh, to do this because well, you need a big computer that does all the cal calculations. And well, some some five years ago. To calculate one image took, well, maybe two or three minutes. Uh, well, two or three minutes might not be such a long time, but if you want to scan an entire well at one millimeter position, do the math. It takes a lot of time. Um, so let's have a look at some, uh, some basic uh, uh, results. Here is my experiment. I have a probe with 64 elements. This is a piece of uh, metal uh, with an indication right there. Uh, and, well, I do my experiment, and then this is typically the type of image that you get. Uh, well, this explains your questions uh, right away. What you can see here is you can see a back wall in the image, uh, because, well, yes, you get reflections from your back wall, and hence it shows up in your image. Uh, you also get an, uh, uh, an, uh, the waves that are traveling directly over the surface, that gives this, uh, this, in, this, this area right there. But then also you can see that this machined defect has an orientation, it has a size, and it has a location. And that is something that you can see uh, back into this image. Um, of course, the resolution and, and uh, well, how sharp it is depends on a lot of factors. For example, your, uh, your properties of your, of your pulse. I can send a pulse with a lot of cycles, uh, or I can send in a pulse with not so many cycles. And of course, the less cycles I have, the sharper this uh, this, this image uh, will become. Um, and, and if the wall is no longer, let's say, perfectly plain wall, but if it's indented, or yeah. Well, uh, uh, what you would see then is that this the the shape of the of the geometry is also imaged until a certain extent. So so if you have um, uh, well a varying surface, then then that will be, for example, corrosion. Uh, you, you would see that as well in your image. Uh, but that's another application that we're working on. Uh, now one limitation, as you can see here, is I have this dead zone. So if there was a defect right underneath there, then it might be obscured by the fact that I have these surface waves. So I need to do something with that. Uh, and one of the things, and that is also one of the big differences within metal and human tissue, uh, is that I have these these strong reflections from the boundaries. So this defect right there uh, is obscured by the fact that I have these surface waves. However, um, the back wall is a mirror. So if I continue my imaging process in depth, the computer doesn't know that it's reflected. It just thinks that it's deeper. So if I continue my imaging process, then I see uh, that the defect is revealed right there because uh, the travel path has gone through the back wall as a mirror. Uh, and that path is not hindered by any surface reflections. So, as a matter of fact, I can make two different images. One from arrivals that, are, that have a direct path, but also from arrivals that are bounced from the, from the back wall. So the only thing I have to do is take this image, cut it in half, and then flip it up, upside so that I can uh, reveal this defect right there. And again here you see this pattern, uh, which is sometimes illustrated in, uh, in the grayscale. Depends a bit, you'll, you'll have some options of, uh, of post-processing. Um, but then again, you, you, you can clearly see that there's a defect. The orientation is not so much revealed because, well, this orientation, it's, it's a very small defect compared to the wavelength that you're using. So if you want to have more accurate, well then you should go to a high frequency. Um, well, what I just illustrated is that you can use the back wall as a mirror, and what we refer to is, is IWAX modes. So you can use uh, the travel path from a direct configuration, uh, which is direct mode, but also through the back wall, uh, and then also, for example, a tandem type of configuration. And having these different type of configurations has an advantage because some defects are better imaged. Uh, depending on their location 
than others. So for example, this type of defect, well, uh, it's very nicely imaged uh, by this type of configuration. Defects that are close to the, to the upper surface are better imaged uh, using the back wall as, an, as a mirror. And these vertical uh, type of defects are best imaged uh, by this, this, this round trip <coughs> uh, type of configuration. So what you can do with the signals, as you saw it, in the previous picture you saw red and blue. Uh, but also what you can do is you can use an envelope and then because you know in advance travel path, you can color code it. That's a decision that you can, can make. Uh, and hereby you can see very nicely that uh, well, the upper surface is best imaged by this mode, the, the red mode is best imaged by this, and then uh, the direct mode, the blue one, is best imaged by this. Uh, these are nice examples. Um, I got some more. First, of course, machine reflectors. Uh, in this case, we also added some geometry to it. So the cap reinforcement or the roof reinforcement. And here, as you can see, uh, you see the shape of the, of the reinforcement very nicely, uh, but also from, from, from the root. Of course, until some extent, because <coughs> if the sound doesn't get there, well, then you can't image it. The sound has to be able to penetrate, uh, otherwise you, you wouldn't be able to image it. Uh, but it's very nice because this is all the same algorithm uh, and I don't have to assume where the defect is. I don't have to assume what the orientation is. I, actually, I don't have to assume anything. I just can, can, can do this straight away and, uh, and I get the image. Uh, and that is in contrast with the existing methodologies that, that require a, a very thorough calibration procedure in order to do the inspection. But then again, these are nice. Uh, images because they're machined notches. Well, uh, within our company, my colleagues are typically the guys that have seen it all. And well, the first thing they ask is, well, do it on a real weld. Uh, so of course, that's uh, where you go for, uh, for a, a weld, but then first in the workshop, in the laboratory situation. Uh, we have done several of these uh, studies. Uh, and here you can see that this is the system. Um, Actually, this, uh, this is the box of electronics that does the magic. Uh, it's mounted on a, on a guiding band, and then in one circumferential motion, uh, you can inspect the weld. In the workshop, uh, this picture, well, it took quite some time, because we weren't quite as fast with the inspection. It, it took half an hour to do this weld. Um, so yeah, well, it's not very practical, but it's, not, uh, it's, it's one step closer, so to say. Uh, these are some results uh, of that uh, particular weld. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting what you see here because uh, this is basically the raw image that you can see. And, and here you can see, well, this is, of course, in, in, a, in a grayscale. Uh, but again, you can see that the geometry is quite, quite well followed. Uh, you can see here the, uh, the back wall. Um, and you can see the defect. Um, and again, the, the position of the defect is, is, is true to its, to its, uh, to its position. Uh, but also you can see that there's some high-low, and, and it also shows in, in your image. So here you have quite some information, uh, and then again you can use the envelope uh, and color code it to see where it comes from. Uh, well, I think this is a bit blurry, uh, but it's something that you can do. There's Once you have this type of image, you have some abilities of post-processing. Uh, and during the development, we, we, we tried a bit what, what worked best, and uh, uh, eventually, you need to develop a field application whereby you make a decision how to present the results. Um, and this is basically uh, where we ended up. Uh, this is the type of image where we, where we again use the envelope, uh, but then rather than giving labels or colors to different modes, we said, well, okay, maybe it's best to have only a single image, but then the strength of the image is um, displayed in uh, in a color scale. So um, these are the latest uh, images that you can see. Let's see what we have here. Uh, we have a lack of fusion defect. It's actually two defects, a large cavity. Well, you can see that there's something going on in your in your IOX image. Uh, this one is bigger, so you get a, a, a higher strength. Uh, there's high low. Uh, that high low causes a large reflective area right there that you can see here. 
Um, the envelope, again, is, uh, is color-coded, so the geometry is, is very well imaged. Uh, also what you see is that, well, I have to tell the computer uh, where my backwall is. Uh, and that's related to the fact that I have two images that I, that I fold, fold together. <coughs> so if there's variations in the wall thickness, for example, due to high-low, um, that folding over uh, causes a, a double backwall. Um, and we know that it's there because we know that it's caused by the, uh, by the difference in, in wall thickness. So we, we can anticipate for it. Uh, at the moment, we're still working on the algorithm to, to correct for that. Uh, but for now, we know that it's there and we know how to interpret it. Um, this is a nice example of a, a lack of fusion uh, defect right under the cap. <coughs> and you can see that, um, well, it's the difficult part of this type of defect is that you would like to know the distance from the surface to the defect itself because that is something that you need to put in in the calculations. Uh, again, you can see the reflection of the defect through the, uh, through the front wall because it's, it's a mirror. Well, the defect is, is seen from, from multiple uh, angles. Um, but still you can see that, that the defect is, uh, is, is very, very nicely revealed. Um, here's another example <coughs> from uh, a hood defect. Now, having two-dimensional images uh, it's very nice, uh, but eventually, if you look at, again, the other uh, applications, you have three-dimensional images. So, basically what we do is, if we make a two-dimensional image and we scan the circumference, you'll have a series of these two-dimensional images. And you can process that series of two-dimensional images into a three-dimensional image. And that's what's done here. So, um, again, it, it almost looks like a tunnel. Uh, here's the defect. And in 3D, you see that this defect has a, has a length to it. So thereby, you are able to assess the height, which is basically uh, given uh, by this shape, uh, but also the length of the defect. Uh, now, this is one other, other example. Uh, it's a huge lack of uh, fusion defect. And, um, well, again, clearly you can see that it is a lack of fusion defect because the location is, is right on top of the weld bevel. Uh, and then also, if you see this in 3D, uh, you see that it, that it has this type of shape. Now, compared to other uh, inspection methodologies, this, this is really an, an, an added value because, well, it, it, it is an input into the uh, ECL cal calculations. So, um, yeah, but you do that not, you do not know where it is because you make the cross section. So yeah. At the end, you know, but if you only have that picture, you know that it's, uh, it's at the weld. Uh, um, can, you, can you ask the question again and see if yeah, I... Okay, you make a cross-section afterwards, yeah. and then you see that the, the position is right, yeah. like a fusion. Yeah. But it can be something else, because you do not know exactly if it's like a fusion. Or well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. You do not know exactly if it's like a lack of fusion. Uh, but given the well, the welding process, it's it's most likely that yeah, it's like a fusion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, if you see th this, of course, is a is a defect that has a very nice uh, flat surface. But sometimes you see defects with this type of hooks, uh, or or a lack of interim fusion defects. And the variety of defects that you'll find in this type of welds can be can be very very large. So existing methodologies do not accommodate so much for, for this variety, and that introduces an error in your, uh, in your sizing, sometimes even in your probability of detection. Um, this methodology is not so much dependent on, on, on this variety, and thereby you have a more, um, more uh, well, a better way of assessing your defect. So, coming to some concluding words, um, what I have presented to you is, well, Non-destructive testing is important to avoid pipeline failure. That's a bit of an open door, but completes the story. Uh, there are existing methods. Uh, the existing method methods are the benchmark, but they have limitations. Uh, limitations in detection, again, depending on uh, what the defect looks like. Uh, they have limitations in characterization and sizing of the defect, uh, but also sometimes practical limitations in terms of safety or inspection speed. 
however, with the introduction of ultrasonic array technology, uh, we have more options. And uh, what we've done is we used these ultrasonic array technology to measure wave fields. Now, these wave fields, um, we use those to, uh, to make a data set. And by means of inverse wave field extrapolation, uh, we are able to make two-dimensional images and also three-dimensional images of it. Uh, so then some advantage of this uh, uh, IWAX methodology is it's, it's less dependent on operator skill because it's, it's very intuitive. You can see the cross-section. Uh, and, well, if you have this welding overlay, then, then you'll have an idea as to where the defect is or what it could be. Um, it's less dependent on, on calibration reflectors, so I, I do not have to assume or I do not have to relate my amplitude to a known defect because the size of the defect is, is in capture in the image itself. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that I need to set some sensitivity, but it's not that you use the amplitude for sizing. Um, so the reliability of the, uh, mm. the, the detection and the sizing is more accurate, um, and therefore it also better accommodates for engineering critical assessment. The information that we get out of these pictures, uh, well, as of course that's the intention, um, is more suitable to feed directly into the, into the calculations. Uh, well, the 3D visualization is more comprehensive. And uh, the last thing that I would like to show, but therefore I need to switch the computer a bit, uh, is, is the field readiness. Uh, I've demonstrated basically the evolution of first doing some measurements on uh, machine reflectors. Uh, from that, you go to welds in the workshop, but eventually we would like to bring this technology to the field under real circumstances uh, where conditions are often very harsh. Um, and, well, last February we have done some tests uh, for one of our clients in Canada. And that is something that I would like to, uh, to show you as well. <coughs> so here we have uh, uh, the scanner. This is the guiding band. Um, the equipment is placed onto the uh, uh, band and set at a certain starting position. And that starting position marks the, uh, uh, the circumference. So that's how you can find your, your defect in uh, along the circumference. Uh, this is still the two-dimensional vision where you can see um, where, you can, where you saw the defect. And as you can see, the data is coming in. Uh, so at this moment, the scanner is moving around the pipe. And this is what the operator sees. It sees uh, the tunnel vision through the weld, and of course you can you can rotate it um, around so so that you have perspective on uh, uh, on the defect. Do you need any preparation of the surface? I mean, is the trans transmission of the, of the wave from the trans let's say the source to the material is that not an issue? Uh, well, you, you need an ultrasonic coupling, and uh, typically we use water for that. Um, in the medical field, they have these gels. Uh, uh, in this particular case, because the uh, weather conditions were, were quite quite cold, uh, you, you use a mixture of, uh, uh, of uh, ethanol or methanol to avoid it from freezing. So you do, you do need a, a coupling agent. The entire inspection uh, it depends a bit on uh, the wall thickness and, of course, on the diameter of the pipe. Uh, but typically, the speed that we are able to achieve uh, is comparable to existing uh, methodologies. But it is it is it is slower, uh, not by a factor ten or so. Uh, but the computer needs to do a lot of calculations, and that that has has a consequence for the uh, for the inspection speed. Okay. Well, looking at my watch, I think I. Uh, kept it within, uh, within half an hour. Oh, thank you. <coughs>